So like they said in my introduction, uh, long story short, I am a marketing nerd. I love to talk and research and study marketing, digital marketing, and special events. And so if you have any specific questions, if you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, please, please, please put them in the mobile app. And then if I do not get to them during this presentation, uh, I will also be responding there after the, the conversation. I always like to start my presentations with a roadmap so that you know exactly where we are going and what we are going to be talking about uh, for two reasons. One, I think it just helps with the flow. And two, if you decide that this is not the presentation for you, you can drop off and go do something else. There's lots of opportunities and lots of ways that you can fly. And it does not hurt my feeling. I have a very lovely therapist that'll help me get over if you decide to leave my session early. So this is what we're going to be going through today. And I hope that this is what you were expecting uh, when you signed up for this session. So looking at the numbers, these are some statistics that came from uh, BEC, which is a brand experience collective. They are the organization that does research and does consulting for some of the largest special events and brand activations uh, on the planet. And looking at their survey from the end of April and then continuing some of their research into this month uh, here in October, we've seen that 75% of organizations around the globe are looking at virtual events. And that is, of course, because of the major shift in culture and in planning uh, that's been caused by this pandemic. So virtual events are here to stay. The vast majority, 31% at the time of the survey, which is now actually trending up to almost 45%, do not anticipate doing any in-person activations until 2021. And a recent study from the PCMA, which is a meeting planners organization, has shown that a vast majority of event organizers are also looking at potentially pushing their in-person events until 2022. And so virtual events are the thing that we need to be mindful of. Uh, they are something that's here to stay, and it's going to take a, a little bit for us to get back to some sort of sense of normalcy. And so if you have not bought into the idea of virtual events, or if you're not convinced, hopefully some of these stats will help you drink the Kool-Aid a little bit. I also think it's important for us to look at events not just as a, a practical piece, but as a, a piece of our heritage. When you look at the way that anthropologists define when a society tr truly develops culture, it usually starts when they start exhibiting events, things that mark the passage of time, things that mark major milestones in a person's life. These are the things that truly create a culture, that create a society. So far to the point that UNESCO, which is the United Nations World Heritage Organization, has identified them as part of a global intangible heritage. So event organizers, despite being the most caffeinated and often the most stressed people in the room, are also the gatekeepers of their community's culture. And when you think of major events or major things in your own personal life, it could be things like graduation, it could be things like uh, religious events, like baptisms or communions, it could be things that mark the ending of a life, like a funeral, these are the major events that many of us kind of guide our year and guide our time by. Even things incidentally, like we know Accessibility Fest is always in the fall. We know that the Super Bowl is always going to be on a Sunday in the spring. And these are the things that many of us mark our calendars by. So events are very important for our culture, for our community. And just because we are often locked at home or stuck at home because of this pandemic does not mean that we should not be having these events because they are important parts of of life. Now, really quickly, a webinar is not a virtual event. Uh, a lot of folks are confusing the two, and there's lots of webinar software out there, but a webinar is a workshop, it is a class, it is a one-off. Virtual events and events in general have very specific criteria. The element of a virtual event or event in general is number one that it is purpose driven. You have a virtual event for a specific purpose, not just to have a class, not just to have a social gathering on a Zoom call or play some games online. 
A purpose could be something like education or learning. It could be community building or capacity building. It could be celebrations like online graduations. Virtual events have a specific purpose. There is a communication loop. I think uh, part of this conversation is is about that loop, right? Because we have someone who is interpreting in sign language. We have folks that are replying in chat. We have folks that are asking questions in the mobile app. And I, as a presenter, am also engaging with that. And so it's about this communication loop where it's not just one directional communication, it's multi-directional communication. Generally, virtual events have multiple sessions or a very, very long session. So that's usually where the webinar is not a virtual event comes into play. Virtual events are about community building in one way or another, and that's why the most successful virtual events are built around specific community, whether it's the disability advocacy community, whether it's a marketing community, whether it's people that celebrate a specific sports team or that are from a specific school or school district. It's all about establishing and promoting community. Virtual events are platform enabled which also means that they are not an SBNR because for the platform enablement, you have to have uh, the mobile app. You have to have ways for people to communicate and engage. And lastly, virtual events have some sort of cohesive branding that is usually conducive to them happening over and over again. Like Melanie said, this is the 14th annual Accessibility Fest. And so that branding continues onward. You have these reoccurring events that are built behind this brand that have an entire sense memory and entire spirit behind them. Much of the time when I'm working with customers or clients, I often hear, well, what platform should I use? And before you even start discussing what platform you should be using, I'm a firm believer in Louis Sullivan, who is an American architect's famous quote that form follows function. And that is, you should look at your goals for the event. You should look at the concept for the event. You should look at what the event is seeking to do before you even spend a single moment researching the software or the platform itself. And I think to do it the other way is uh, a little bit backwards. And let's talk about that. So when you're creating your event, I think the first piece of, of decision-making that has to be done is looking at planning criteria, like what is the actual format for the event? Is there a single track? Today's Accessibility Fest is a great example. The leadership track, there's no overlaps. You can sit in sessions back to back to back and be part of this leadership track of programming. Are there concurrent tracks? Tomorrow's Accessibility Fest, there are some overlapping sessions. There are other things that you can do other than sitting in sessions. Are there gonna be sessions plus interactive breakouts? Are there gonna be interactive sessions like roundtables, masterminds, uh, some sort of creative thing? And so deciding what format your event will take will greatly dictate and actually Im immediately eliminate some virtual event platforms. Next, in the marketing and corporate world, we call these key performance indicators. But really what that means is what is success for your organization or for your event? For many, an attendance number is the thing that you strive for. With my convention that I host on Labor Day weekend, we are always looking to grow bigger and be better every year. And so being able to tell people that we had 20,000 people last year is our, our big metric for success. For some, it's more about engagement. We know that some events will never grow to a huge size, but their attendees are deeply engaged, deeply connected, and get really meaningful information and meaningful connection from the event. Some events are revenue driven. These could be things like concerts or performances. These are all about generating revenue and selling different tiers of tickets or different types of tickets or experiences to make money. And as we've seen a lot more in the corporate world, there's also a lead generation goal for events. And so if you are ever on one of those webinars, one of those virtual events or one of those calls where at the very end, uh, the punchline is you should buy our product and someone will be reaching out to you uh, then odds are the goal for that event was lead generation, getting people to engage so that they can capture their email address, capture their contact information, and later on reach out and try to sell something. So before you begin looking at platforms, I highly encourage you to start right here.
the other thing that you need to consider or another piece that you need to think about is when you're planning an event in person, you often get caught up on what the venue can do. The amount of attention and the amount of concern that you would put to an in-person venue should be equal to or greater than the amount that you would do for your, your online platform. And so your platform is your venue. So you would not just pick a venue because it's the least expensive. You would not pick a venue because it checks most of the boxes. When you're planning an event, your venue should be perfect for that event or as perfect as possible. And so with your venue, which is your online software, and I can tell you now we will not be making a specific recommendation for a type of software. I can talk to you offline about that. Um, but I think from case to case, there is not one perfect event software out there. So number one is how do your attendees purchase or otherwise gain access to the event? Do they need to buy tickets? Do they need to site sub, which means subscribing to a website? Do they need to download software? Do they need to have a computer? Do they need to have a cell phone? How do the attendees connect to the event? Next, how will the attendees see the schedule and the program of events? Do they have to have Zoom on their computer? Do they have to have specific software to see the videos, to see the PDFs, to see the different files and formats that are out there? How are the attendees actually engaging with the content of your event? Next, how do the speakers and special guests gain access to the event? Are your speakers going to be gated through a separate uh, tool? Do they have to submit their slides and their content ahead of time? Do they have to be trained on how to use it? Uh, with the platform that we're using today, if you know how to use Zoom, you know how to use this platform, which makes it very easy. Many other event platforms have their own custom video chat or custom video programs. And so there is a learning curve that may require additional time with your speakers or special guests to make sure that they're comfortable presenting on the software. So being mindful of this, I think, is very important, especially if you have speakers or special guests that are being paid to be there or that may not have a lot of time to do any sort of pre-work, pre-testing, or pre-engagement. Next, how do sponsors and exhibitors engage with the attendees? And this is really the big question. This is the million-dollar question. I've probably attended slightly over 200 virtual events since March. And no one has figured out the right way to do exhibitor booths, exhibitor engagement, and sponsor engagement on virtual events. So if you feel like as you are planning your event, as you are creating your event, you haven't quite gotten down the subtle nuances of what would normally be a booth or a talk or a presentation for your sponsors and exhibitors, don't feel bad because even the largest companies, even the most expensive event software still has not figured it out. And I think a great example just happened a couple of weeks ago. There was a conference called Inbound, which normally brings 60,000 attendees to Cincinnati. This event typically has giant booths, crazy build out, lasers and projections and all the sorts of event technology that you would see at a show in Las Vegas. And because of the pandemic, they did have to move it online. They used a custom event platform, which made the sessions fantastic, which made the attendee experience wonderful. But in the end, their exhibitor hall was still just a series of websites and links and video chats. And so don't feel bad if you have not figured out sponsors and exhibitors. Nobody has. And if you feel like you've really figured it out, please call me because you probably are sitting on a gold mine. You are, can make yourself very wealthy by doing that. And lastly, where does the content live after the event is over? I know right now I can look at my screen and see that it is being recorded. I know that for those who are on the call or who may jump on later, they can access this content after the fact. Some event platforms do not have that option. If you miss it, you miss it. It's like a real in-person event. Some of the content would always have to live on certain event platforms' websites, which means that you are paying for that platform even after your event is over. Some of them let you download that content after the fact. And so these are questions that as you are starting to audit software, as you start to look at different places that you can host your event, different venues, um, these are the questions you need to be asking along with sharing those previous questions about your goals, your expectations, and the things you're trying to accomplish with your event.
let's look at some examples of some events that I think are really fantastic. Uh, there are three that I'd like to go through. Again, if you have questions, please ask them in the app, and then when we get to the end, I'll go ahead and try to answer as many uh, live as we can get through. The first one is an event called WordCamp San Antonio. WordCamp is part of an international series of people who develop or create websites in a piece of coding or a coding platform called WordPress. Now, WordCamp San Antonio, I've been on the organizing team in the past. I've been part of the team previously. The biggest in-person event that it's been able to achieve has been roughly 350 people over a three-day event. Normally, WordCamp happens in the early spring, and this year they had a unique challenge. They had been planning for over a year to do WordCamp in person at UTSA downtown. And then first week of March, the pandemic hits. So what are they to do? They've already sold a lot of tickets. They've already had backing from global sponsors. They have the love and support of the San Antonio community. And the amazing people at WordCamp San Antonio, led by Susan Smiley and Charlotte Ann Lucas, uh, decided to move it online. And so in just two weeks, they turned a multiple day, multiple track business conference into an online event. And just by moving it online, they actually grew from 350 attendees to over 1,400 attendees. The previous WordCamp last year, the furthest uh, attending attendee came from Dallas or from Houston. This year, there were attendees from China, there were attendees from Australia, there were attendees from Africa and all over Europe. They truly turned what was previously a regional event into a global activation. And I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but there is a quote here from an agency owner. And she says, I don't think I felt this good in a while speaking and attending WordCamp San Antonio, albeit virtual versus in person, is the closest that I felt to normal. And going back to that UNESCO conversation, people love events. Events are how people pass their time, mark their year. And so by keeping this event intact, by moving it online, they were able to extend a sense of normalcy to their attendees. And people are still talking about it. This is still an ongoing case study uh, for online events. If you get a copy of the slides, which I will upload to the mobile app probably tomorrow afternoon, you can actually click on WordCamp San Antonio and it'll take you to a full case study talking about what they did, what they learned, their successes, their failures, and a couple of shorter interviews with some of the organizing committee. So I highly encourage you to check that out uh, when you get access to the slides. Student admission day. For those who went to college, you surely remember your first day on campus. Maybe you had your parents in tow, and this is when you had that whirlwind trip where you took a tour, you met the financial aid people, you maybe set up your schedule, you looked at dorms, you talked to people from Greek life, you did all the things in one day to try to get you ready before you were fully admitted to the college. With the pandemic, people were unable to do this. And so we worked with uh, FIT New York, which is part of the State University of New York. It's the Fashion Institute of Technology. And we try to figure out what would be a great way for them to be able to do this in an online setting. Now, because of the pandemic, a lot of the folks were not on campus. They had not been on campus for months and months. Many of them were working remotely. Many of them were unable to get back into the city due to travel restrictions. And so rather than having only a series of Zoom rooms, rather than thinking of their virtual event linearly, they decided to have a combination of pre-recorded content, scheduled content, interactive content, and self-guided content that they put onto a single page that they called Admitted Student Day. Now, this information fair, which you can see part of the screen cap on your screen, uh, had more than a dozen different campus departments and campus organizations involved with it. 
They had pre-recorded conversations and pre-recorded information sessions from many of the department heads. Beneath each video, they could click, a student could click rather, and join a session in progress or schedule a one-on-one -on -one time with whatever that department would be. And then further down on the page, which I apologize, I don't have the screen cap on here, students could actually meet each other, share content through platforms like Instagram or TikTok, and actually start to engage with fellow students before they ever got on campus or before they ever really truly enrolled. They had thousands of students come through this, and despite the fact that New York City is starting to open up again, many of the students and faculty and staff are already asking if they can repeat this just because it makes it so much easier a workload on the departments. It makes it easier to, to guide the students through the process. And it makes it easier for parents to also stay involved and stay engaged as their high school students move into their college life. And so don't think that you have to have fancy software you have to have a fancy platform to make an engaging and amazing virtual event. This was done with a single website page, a series of pre-recorded YouTube videos, and some embedded and aggregated or gathered TikTok and Instagram posts. And I would say that this is probably one of the more successful virtual events that I've seen um, come out this year. For those that are in nonprofit land, looking at some of the attendees, I know that many of you work in the nonprofit space. Uh, virtual events as a fundraiser is something that is becoming increasingly popular. I think the ultimate case study, which again is linked here uh, in a New York Times article from April, is the Met Gala that they had. The Met Gala has been happening since 1948. It has been an event where celebrities, where performers, musicians, opera singers get together and they do heavy duty fundraising for the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. Thanks to this online virtual event, they were able to circumvent almost $60 million in losses. And that's a great number. That's a fantastic goal and a fantastic effort. But I think the important thing and the really interesting thing is every single session with the exception of the key narration was recorded on an iPhone or recorded on a laptop. And you can see here on the mosaic that's on the screen, they were able to record opera singers around the world where many of them were quarantining or sheltering in place. They were able to record musicians around the world and then using basic video editing software, splice them all together. And so just because you are having a virtual event does not mean that all of it has to be live, does not mean that all of it has to be in person. It is okay to do part of it pre-recorded. It's okay to do part of it low tech. And I think that's the expectation. So don't think you have to go and buy expensive lights. Do not think you have to go buy an expensive camera or an expensive microphone. If the Metropolitan Opera of New York City can do one of the most phenomenal concerts and you can still buy tickets to the concert, I highly encourage you to go check it out or at least look at some of the recordings on YouTube. If they can do it on <clears throat> last generation iPhones and old computers and bad internet connections, then you can do it too, no matter where you are in the world. So we won't get too much more into the planning process. I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time to answer questions um, that are coming in. I do see a couple of your questions coming through. When you are planning your event, whether it's in-person or virtual, you always have to have your exit strategy. I believe the quote is, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, which can be shortened to stuff happens. <laughs> so Event Marketer, which is a magazine focused on special events, event marketing, and brand experiences, released their punch list for what you should be doing right before your event is happening. So number one, you should be reaching out to your virtual event provider, whatever your software company is, and just ask them, are you good? Is your traffic good? Are there any issues? Do you expect any major updates to deploy? Are there anything that could mess up our event that are completely out of our hands? Sometimes they may say yes, and you may have to move very quickly in the middle of the night 
to prevent these issues. But if you don't ask the question, you won't be armed with that information. Next, find out who else is going to be live in that software on the same day. You may have a relatively small virtual event, but if there is a major concert, if there's a major performance, if there's a presidential debate that's also happening on the same platform, you don't want to have your bandwidth or your access pushed out because there's another major event happening simultaneously. Next, create a decision tree for what happens if something goes wrong, if a speaker cannot make an appearance, if a sponsor cannot uh, appear, if an exhibitor is unable to log in, if an attendee cannot get in. Make sure that you have a plan, a standard operating procedure, and a decision tree for whose job it is to handle that, whose job it is to engage with that, and whose job it is to blame for that. Now, this is often a sad exercise, but I always encourage you to draft up cancellation copy ahead of time. There's nothing worse than having to cancel a, an event. I've had to cancel many the day before, the morning of, and you will likely be frazzled, you will be stressed out, you will be upset. And trying to sit down and mindfully write sensible cancellation copy is really, really difficult. So save yourself some stress, draft up cancellation notices ahead of time, and hope and pray that you never have to use it. Next, call it quick. If you have to cancel an event, don't draw it out, don't tap dance, don't pander, call it. If you need to cancel it, call it quick, call it early. And if not, then the show must go on. And lastly, create a contingency. If something happens along the way, can you move it to Facebook Live? Can you move it to YouTube? Can you move it to another platform quickly, expeditiously, and still have the same sort of event feel to it? All right, a couple of best practices. Number one, be creative. No one's figured out all the secret sauce. Uh, no one's figured out the special recipe for the perfect virtual event. It could be you, so be creative. Make something different. Do something outside of the box. Create an experience. The best events are surrounded or created around an experience, and experiences can be virtual. Next, don't be negative. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, your ability. Don't be negative because there's technological solutions out there that can help you solve it and help you get through it. And lastly, don't be intimidated by the technology. I sell technology for a living. I can tell you that a lot of the times there's lots of big words, there's lots of crazy acronyms, there's lots of strange terms. And the reality is people that work in tech, people that sell technology, we just get in the habit of using those abbreviations or shorthand. And so don't be intimidated by it pause the person that you are working with and tell them, hey, I don't understand this term. I don't quite get what this means. Can you explain this more clearly or can you explain this to someone who does not have a technical understanding? And I can guarantee the good ones will take a lot of time and explain that to you. And the bad ones, well, you probably don't want to be working with them in the first place. So kick them to the curb. <laughs> So on that note, I hope you will all join us in the next session that's coming up in about five minutes. And for our friends who are deaf in the audience today, I think we got the bugs worked out and thank you for your patience. Um, thank you, Jenny, for your interpretation. And um, we will move along to the next session. You guys who are not joining us, please have a wonderful day and come back and join us for another session this afternoon. Thank you, David.